Nitin, and I thank you all for uh, attending this uh, uh, seminar, uh, the webinar on the on this forum. So thank you so much, uh, all of you. So before, uh, so uh, uh, you know, without wasting much time, I will quickly start through the presentation because uh, there are some uh, initial slides which are about the freshwater ecosystems. So Deepak told me that put some introduction on the freshwater ecosystem. There might be audience who are not familiar with the freshwater ecosystem. So I will quickly roll through these initial slides and then we will uh, I will start with actual presentation. So, uh, as you uh, know, that uh, yeah, if you are interested to know more about the freshwater biodiversity, I will suggest to you to, uh, I will highly recommend you, in fact, to, uh, to go through these three recent reports or the papers through the, uh, which was published by the WWF, the World's Forgotten Fishes and the Living Planet Index for Migratory Fish and the uh, Freshwater Fish. So, this will give you a, a global perspective of freshwater biodiversity. Where does it start as compared to the marine and terrestrial ecosystems? So, I will just quickly, uh, uh, I will quickly go through this uh, first uh, initial introductory slides because they are not very important uh, for, uh, you know, this particular uh, uh, webinar on the topic. So, fre uh, uh, on our planet, the freshwater ecosystems cover, uh, you know, less than one percent of the Earth's surface. That is almost like uh, that only accounts for point not one percent of the world's uh, uh, water. So. Uh, 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 you know, you can uh, see that how minuscule amount of uh, ecosystem or the minuscule amount of uh, biome we have on our planet as compared to the other ecosystems like the terrestrial and the marine ecosystems. But besides this, uh, 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 but although, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, the freshwater on uh, Earth is uh, really, you know, is we can call it rare. Okay, but this rare ecosystem supports almost 10% of all known species and almost one third of all vertebrate uh, species. And if we go for the size to size comparison, the freshwater ecosystems are more rich in abundance as well as in the species diversity compared to those uh, counterparts, that is terrestrial and the marine ecosystems. So this uh, uh, basically highlights the, how important this freshwater ecosystem is to, to the human beings, okay. So uh, when it comes to fish, almost 51% of all fish species uh, are found in the freshwater ecosystems. Uh, you know, so you can you can actually guess that how diverse these ecosystem are, so our, uh, freshwater ecosystems are as compared to marine ecosystems. But besides this uh, uh, fact, there is also a fact that we should not forget that freshwater uh, resources and uh, freshwater biodiversity in general throughout the globe is declining so rapidly. So uh, the recent Living Planet Index report by the WWF suggests that uh, freshwater biodiversity has declined by almost 84%. That means the LPI, Living Planet Index, it indicates the ecosystem size. So it has declined by almost 84%, which is, uh, you know, twice the rate uh, of you know uh, the decline of uh, LPF or the marine and the terrestrial ecosystem. So this kind of uh, you know uh, uh, really a bad situation. We are really in bad situation. Or freshwater ecosystems are really in bad situation. I can say we uh, in India mostly and uh, 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 most likely in other countries as well. We treat uh, freshwaters or we consider freshwaters uh, you know as a symbol uh, as a cultural symbol. Okay, because it it is uh, our rivers, uh, you know, are uh, often we link our rivers often with uh, our culture. You know, we consider river as a deity or the goddess, but uh, you know we even treat them like a goddess. But we do not take care of our rivers as you know as we should have taken for it. So um, and uh, uh, and uh, in all, you know uh, the problem here is we are not treating. Uh, fresh water on our planet as the precious, uh, you know, as a precious resource. You know, almost 40 to 70 percent of the land in India uh, is going through the desertification, and the problem is uh, getting much bigger now. We are facing a uh, on uh, uh, in monsoon season, we are facing a problem with like a floods, uh, you know, everywhere. There are floods everywhere, but in uh, you know dry season, we face sewer droughts. There is sewer water crisis you will see everywhere, and that is because of desertification. This is the impact of the climate change. You will see the sudden floods and you will see the extreme droughts uh, uh, you know in the dry periods uh, 
throughout the globe uh, there are about 2 billion people they live at the risk uh, you know they suffer through the risk of uh, sewer water scarcity and uh, this is why it is important because water is directly connected to our uh, to our economy if you do not have water or if there is a problem with water or if there is a water scarcity in your uh, in the country definitely that country is going to face the economic problems and uh, therefore if you know uh, uh, that you know it's my personal opinion that we should treat water crisis issues as you know as a national security issues and only after that um, you know uh, we can see some good uh, uh, future for our freshwater ecosystem and why uh, uh, why they are suffering why this freshwater ecosystem are suffering so badly there are multiple reasons uh, basically uh, almost all anthropogenic activities they contribute to the freshwater biodiversity decline or the fresh Water ecosystem decline. Uh, you know, uh, including uh, we modify rivers, uh, we build dams, including hydroelectric power plants, irrigation dams. We also, uh, you know, uh, destroy uh, river and ecosystems through the pollution. Uh, pollution. So there are uh, this kind of problem. Also, the species are going extinct because of uh, uh, overfishing. Uh, because of invasive species problems as well. So all these anthropogenic activities, they contribute, they are contributing to the, uh, all these factors are contributing to the decline of freshwater ecosystems worldwide. worldwide. So, um, uh, and because of uh, this, almost one third, the recent estimates suggest that almost one third of all freshwater species are facing the threat of extinction almost all one third of freshwater fish species and among them the freshwater fish species are the second most threat threatened group of vertebrates which are facing the highest risk of extinction so um, uh, in in uh, you know in all this uh, 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 chaos if we have to implement the conservation policies uh, we should we should have some of the basic information of our biodiversity in hand okay so and it when it comes to the basic information it often starts with uh, how many species you have how uh, and uh, how much diversity you have and how these species are distributed because these are the factors that uh, you know matter a lot in planning and implementing the conservation policies so uh, let's have a look at the global distribution of freshwater uh, fish species so if you look at this map uh, most of the freshwater fish species you will see accumulated in the tropical regions you know in the in the latin american countries in the afro tropical countries and in uh, india and other asian countries south and southeast asian countries uh, so, uh, and if you look at the maximum number of endemic species where they are in, uh, in specific, now I'm specifically talking about India. So in India, uh, uh, so I'm just, hold on, I'm using a pointer here. So in India, there is the Western Ghats of uh, you know India and Sri Lanka. There is the uh, this biodiversity hotspot, and there is uh, you know the uh, Northeast Indian uh, region that uh, have the maximum amount of uh, you know endemic. In, uh, I mean, this region shows the maximum amount of endemism in the uh, when it, uh, endemism in the freshwater fish species. Uh, diversity. So my particular interest is in Western Ghats because most of my work, uh, whatever I have, I have carried out my work. Uh, you know, I have I have worked across the uh, India in uh, on the uh, in uh, islandic regions as well, like the Andaman and Nicobar. But my most of work is uh, in the is in the Western Ghats. And for this uh, specific uh, for today's topic, I will specific. I'm going to specifically speak about the Western Ghats only. <coughs> So um, uh, currently in India, we have about 870 primary freshwater fish species. So I'm talking about only primary freshwater fish species, not the secondary freshwater fishes. And this number is not, uh, this figure is really old actually. So uh, it can be it can be more than that because in last three or four years, we have seen many species, description, new species description. So in general, there are more than 60% of fish species are endemic to, uh, to the region. And in West, specifically in the Western Ghats, we have about 420 species. Again, this figure is uh, pretty old. So probably it could go up to the 430 species. And in Western Ghats, we are seeing the extreme high level of endemism 
uh, not just at species level, but also at a family and the genus level. And uh, you know, I have put some pictures over here of uh, this column snakehead, and there is a cave catfish. So the Enigma chinidae was, uh, you know, is the latest family, a new family uh, of the cave fish that uh, was described from the Kerala just last year in 2020. And there is another family that got described in the 2014. So you can, uh, that, you know, what, what these discoveries uh, can tell you is that how rich this region is and how, uh, and what potential this region has. You know, uh, uh, to showcase the uh, the new diversity and for further exploration as well. So, uh, uh, so uh, when it comes to the, the you know fresh uh, uh, you know implementing the uh, conservation uh, pri uh, conservation priorities or the conservation policies, uh, there are certain knowledge gaps that, that we often uh, often face, and because of and these knowledge gaps actually hinders the uh, process of implement uh, process of designing and implementing the conservation policies. And uh, there is a interest, very interesting paper that was published by the uh, uh, published by the Hortel Eton, and where they have classified all these questions or this or the, all these knowledge gaps into the you know seven knowledge gaps, and among them, these first two are very important. That is, first is the linear shortfall and the Wallacean, uh, second is the Wallacean shortfall. So what does linear shortfall suggest that? Uh, uh, linear short, we call it linear shortfall because most of the species on, on, uh, on, on, on in the particular region has not, have not been yet described or have not been yet properly described and cataloged. So, uh, you know, so it suggests that there is still, uh, there are still many more species yet to be described from the particular region. And what Wallacean shortfall suggests is that the distribution of uh, the species, geographical distribution of the species is, uh, you know, incomplete. The knowledge about the uh, geographical distribution of most uh, of species is incomplete. So in, when it comes to conservation policies, these, uh, two informations, uh, you know, these two uh, uh, knowledge gaps are pretty much important uh, for uh, from conservation point of view. So, and uh, uh, and in Western cards, if you say that, uh, uh, you know, in last 10 years, we have seen many new species descriptions from the Western cards. And it, it itself suggests that Western cards is, uh, you know, subjected to the, this region is subjected to the linear and, and the Wallacean shortfall. So uh, okay, so let's start with this uh, topic. So this uh, my uh, PhD. I, uh, well, I mean, I joined Bombay National Institute Society in 2012, and since 2012, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm interested in the fish uh, since my childhood. But uh, uh, you know, specifically, I started working on working on uh, the the on, on the fish research since 2012 or 2011. But when I joined BNHS, I took the um, uh, multiple projects, and uh, because of those projects, I managed to collaborate with uh, multiple people, multiple researchers from the different institutes. Uh, it was it was a great. I mean, it has been so far. It has been a great uh, journey. In 2017, uh, I joined uh, for the PhD program under Dr. Raju Raghun at uh, QFOS in Kerala University of Fisheries and Ocean Studies. And for, for my PhD, I specifically chose this topic, that is small bobs. So, um, you know, what, what are those uh, small bobs? Most of you might have heard this term uh, because it's the most, they are the more, more pop, you know, they are the popular fish in the aquarium trade. So uh, the term barbs that actually comes from the uh, from the uh, you know fish uh, with barbell, uh, you know which has so barbell is uh, uh, you know is kind of tendril which uh, the uh, in in the mouth the uh, uh, near the mouth they have uh, this fish, have. but uh, it is not necessary because some genus uh, uh, because some group of fish they have the barbells and some they don't don't have the barbells at all. And uh, the barbell term has first been used in uh, uh, in the description of barbus barbus. So the uh, so this European barbus barbus species is under the family according to new classification is under the family barbeni. And all these small barbs they belong to the meliogastrini. So it's a very different family. Uh, it's a, a completely different uh, family. And uh, meliogastrini is specifically designated to this to this small bulbs, okay. 
So let's have a, a quick look at the, uh, the classification of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, cyperinidae. So it belongs to the family cyperinidae and uh, subfamilies biliogastrinae. So let's have a quick look at the classification of the cyperinidae. So there are uh, about uh, there are about 10 subfamilies uh, included into the cyperinidae. Uh, so here is the, uh, uh, there are labioninis as well, there are taurinis as well. So taurini is a, a subfamily um, uh, of the of the tors or the hypsolobarbus. So these are the large barbs. Okay, so they are big in size and smiliogastrini has been designated specifically to the to the small barbs. So, okay, uh, and it includes the Asian barbs as well as uh, Afrotrop, uh, you know, Afrotropical barbs. So the barbs, those who are from the tro tropical regions of Africa. Uh, and uh, yes, so yes, and uh, <clears throat> and there are other families as well. So we don't, uh, there is no need to go through this one. So, uh, okay, and according to the recent classification of the smiliogastrinae, there are about 30 valid genera in the, uh, in, in this uh, 13 valid genera have been included into the smiliogastrinae, which includes the Barbados, Daukensia, Haludaria, and there are so many, about 30. And uh, of them are 11 are found in the Western Ghats. So the, those who are present in the Western Ghats, I have highlighted them as a, you know, I have marked them as a, uh, uh, in, the, in the red font. So you can actually say that, go through that. And uh, so uh, among this, there is another interesting genus here. Yeah, here is the 25th one, that is Sayadriya. So uh, this uh, classification I have uh, taken from the uh, catalog of uh, fishes, that is uh, Frick et al. Uh, 2021. But in that, uh, they have considered it uh, Sayadri as a synonym to the, uh, it has been listed as a synonym to the to the Daukensia according to the Rain et al. Uh, 2020. But, uh, you know, in the reality, uh, Rain et al. 2020, they have never uh, synonymized Sayadri with the Daukensia. So, I'm not considering this Sayadri uh, as a synonym of Daukensia. I'm treating this here as a, as a distinct genus, as a valid genus. And it is a valid genus. There are so many characters that can, that that are diagnosable, uh, that keeps them apart from each other. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, uh, okay. So among this, uh, uh, so among this 11 uh, genera in the Western Ghats, there are uh, about, uh, uh, there are about eight genera that have been treated as a barb. So barb is specific, basically is a general term. It's a term that is basically used in the aquarium hobby. Okay, and there are other genres as well in the smiliogastrinae which has never been treated as a barb, so I have not uh, considered them here. Uh, and for my PhD, uh, so my PhD is specifically on these three genus, that is Daukensia, Petia, and Wycomia. So Wycomia is the recently described genus that we described last year in 2020. Okay, so... Um, uh, so all these uh, genus, they were uh, previously, uh, you know, they are now different genus, but they, they, they were previously included into the catch-all genus called the Quinticus. For example, before the description of Daukensia, Lodaria, or even the Pethia, all these species, they were included into the single genus, Quinticus, and it was complete mess, absolutely mess. Uh, but, uh, you know, in 2012, Pethia Gauda et al., uh, they did a fantastic work on this uh, uh, South Asian fishes, on this uh, basically the Pintius uh, group, and they classified it, they segregated all this, this casual Pintius into the, um, into the multiple genus. They described the new genus as well as they, they resurrected some of this uh, genus. So this is kind of, uh, you, know, you know, milestone work that has been done on uh, this uh, on this particular group of uh, fish so currently in daukensia we have about 13 valid specimens of which 12 are found in the western ghats uh, in haludia is uh, the whole genus is endemic to the western ghats uh, Orichthys uh, is uh, distributed across the peninsula of india and of which three are found in the western ghats or might be in, uh, and they are uh, or they might be endemic to the Western Ghats. In, uh, and in Pethia, uh, we have about 42 species. They are distributed across the India as well as through the uh, you know, South and Southeast Asian countries, uh, countries. And of which nine are found in the Western Ghats, in Western Ghats of India, not Sri Lanka. 
And in the print, yes, there are about 45 species, but I don't know the exact figure here in the Western Ghats because uh, yeah, I will talk about that later at the end of this uh, presentation. Why? Sayadriya is again endemic genus to the Western Ghats of uh, India. In Systomus, we have nine valid species, and of which only one is found in the Western Ghats. Uh, it is found in Western Ghats as well as in Sri Lanka uh, and also in the uh, peninsular, uh, peninsular India. So there is not, there is. Uh, I mean, there is no such endemic species in the West Coast for the systemas when it comes to systemas. And Wycomia is again um, uh, endemic genus, uh, very recently described that we described last year. And uh, all these two species are, uh, you know, there are two species in this, and they are uh, the entire genus is endemic to the West Coast. So. Uh, uh, for this, uh, uh, this uh, for this webinar, I will specifically focus on only on the filament bars. I will not talk about the pathia or wycomia because it will, yeah, you know, I need for the, for another webin webinar for this because it will go too long. Uh, so what are this? Uh, very, uh, what are this filament bars? So filament bars is a term. Also, again, it is po very popular term in the uh, aquarium hobby, and we refer the filament bars to those fishes. Uh, you know, uh, mostly uh, where we can see the filamentous extensions of the dorsal fin in the, the uh, you know, uh, in uh, in this uh, particular fish which has been listed under the genus Daukensia. So uh, uh, I will quickly give you some characteristics uh, of uh, this uh, particular genus or this particular group of fish so that you can diagnose them quite uh, quite easily. So there are uh, multiple characters that has been listed uh, listed for uh, this. That is, uh, uh, usually it has the adult size of 80 to 120 millimeter standard length. Uh, another important uh, th thing is to consider is they have the, la uh, the last unbranched ray in this group of fish, uh, last unbranched dorsal fin ray in this group of fish, it's smooth, it's not serrated. Uh, in some certain, some genus like Pathia and Systomus, we have the serrated dorsal, uh, serrated last unbranched dorsal fin ray. And in adult uh, fish, you, you will see the filamentous extensions. You will see the filamentous extensions of the dorsal fin ray. So usually you can see them in the adult males, not in females. Uh, or uh, in some species of Daukensia, they are completely absent. Or you will see the minute extensions of this dorsal fin ray. So, uh, so this is one of character. Uh, another thing is uh, uh, number of uh, uh, fin rays. So in dorsal fin, uh, in the dorsal fin, you will see the four unbranched uh, and the eight branched dorsal fin rays. So I have mentioned here three plus one. So what does it indicates that three are the supernumerary rays, and a, uh, one is the last unbranched dorsal fin ray, and then there are eight branched rays. So these are so these are the eight. Uh, branch dorsal fin rays. Then um, uh, similarly, the anal uh, fin, we have uh, three unbranched uh, uh, unbranched rays and five branched anal fin rays. So three, uh, so in this three, the two are the supernumerary and the worst one is the last unbranched one and the five branched rays. Okay, there is a complete lateral line for all, uh, uh, it uh, is one of the distinguishing character that distinguishes the Daukensha. And other uh, thing is a black horizontally elongated block, uh, blotch you will see, or the spot you will see on the caudal peduncle, and mostly in the adults. And in juveniles, usually they have the color pattern, which consists of three black bars on the body. And uh, in certain species, it completely disappears. These bars completely disappears. And in some species, like, Daukensia tamraparni, like Daukensia aurulius, uh, 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 this you can see those uh, bars actually. Was, I mean, these uh, adult fish they retain the bars. Okay. So uh, before uh, starting, uh, before starting our work on the uh, Daukensia, uh, uh, so this slide will give you a uh, you know brief. Uh, overlook on the classification of Daukensia uh, before I started the work or the, before the uh, our uh, recent paper. So, um, yes, so, uh, okay. So uh, the first revision of this group of fish was carried out by the Pethia Gaudite in the 2005. So it was quite extensive revision of this uh, group of fish, basically filamentous group of fish. Uh, and after that, there was a description by the Devi et al. of uh, uh, Rohani and also uh, the revision of entire uh, catch-all genus Pintius by the Pethia Gauda et al. 2012. So after these three uh, publications, there were uh, nine 
valid species in the there were nine valid species in this uh, whole genus and these species of uh, in Daukensia they were classified into uh, you know generally they were classified into these two groups that is filamentosa complex and the aurelius complex or you can call it filamentosa group or aurelius group so there were Daukensia assimilis exclamatio filamentosa rohani singala those were included into the filamentosa and those and others like aurelius rubrotinctos relinquences Tamraparni was included into the Aurelius complex. And how they were classified? Because uh, in filamentous complex fish, you will usually see the one caudal spot. And that's it. I mean, in this fish, you will not see any other bands on the body. There will be just the one caudal blotch. But in Aurelius complex, usually, usually you will see two or more uh, bands on the body. So here, actually, you can see over here. So these are the uh, two bars over the body. So, uh, they, are, they are present in the Aurelius. In Rubrotinta, there is one blotch. And in Sri Lankasis as well, there are two or three bands. And in Tamraparni as well, you will see three or four uh, uh, vertical uh, bands. So this kind of pattern. So based on these characteristics, they were classified. Uh, but what happened was, <coughs> yes. So, uh, so this were this was the classification uh, was known till the 2017. So before starting, before I started the work. So uh, when I started the work, my objective was uh, specifically was to estimate the species diversity, delineate the species diversity, the extant diversity of this genus, and uh, delineate the distribution range for each species. Okay, so we carried out uh, extensive surveys across the Western Cut. So all these red dots you can see, those we have surveyed actually in, in last uh, four to five years. So uh, uh, almost eight years, I can say, if I consider the previous expeditions. So there are 37 expeditions we carried out and we visited almost more than 75 sampling locations. We uh, collected, uh, we sequenced more than, uh, more than 250 DNA uh, sequences. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, the objective was, uh, and the methodology that we used specifically for this study was, uh, you know, uh, we use the integrative taxonomic approach where we use the molecular tools and techniques. We also use the classical, uh, 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 you know, anatomical approach or the classical anatomy, uh, uh, classical morphological approach as well. Uh, but also, uh, apart from that, in the morphology, we also studied the osteology. That is the anatomical approach we uh, chose uh, for this, uh, part, uh, you know, in this uh, study. So uh, I will, uh, so after going through this presentation, you will realize that why it is important to use the integrative taxonomic approach when you plan your uh, studies, so, you know, okay. So when we started, uh, uh, you know, when we collected all these um, uh, DNA sequences and the specimens from all these uh, locations, okay, and when we sequence it and when we uh, plotted the uh, molecular tree of this, we realize uh, that, uh, you know, the previous classification is not making any sense uh, to us because uh, those previously thought to be different complexes or the different groups like the filamentos and aurelius, they all are coming together in a single, in a, a single clade. Well, they are forming a different clade, but they are clubbing together in a, in a single clade. So here you can see those Daukensha aurelius here, Daukensha Rubrotinta, Tambraparni as well, Sri Lankensis as well, and here you can see the other uh, uh, Daukensha filamentos and the other species of filamentos complex. Okay, and there were other species like uh, this uh, particular, the clade two, which I have marked in the you know uh, mark in the blue uh, color. They were forming different, so it was beyond our understanding why this is happening. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, just have a look at it. So if you to the naked eyes or to, to the layman eyes, one can say that uh, the fish which uh, 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 which are here, like, uh, you know, like uh, Aurelius and the Tamraparni, they are, uh, or the, the Sri Lankans, they are quite different from these two. Yeah, so this fish too, and they are quite different from this because uh, different from this two fish because they look uh, morphologically different. The coloration pattern is different, uh, so it was beyond our understanding that why we are seeing this pattern in the in the uh, in the molecular tree. 
Okay, so to diagnose, to uh, you know, analyze this uh, pattern further, what we did was we carried out a thorough investigation of uh, of all our samples. We, uh, you know, almost uh, 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 you know went through the almost five hundred uh, fish species, and we started a thorough investigation of this one. Uh, okay, but apart from uh, this one, we also realized the fact that uh, in each river system we are seeing the fish from you know so in molecular tree we have uh, uh, come up with these two clades the red one and the blue one so the red one is the clade one and the blue one is the clade two so we realize later that in each river system mostly in the southern western ghats we are seeing this uh, weird pattern okay we are getting a fish uh, for example sita river take care of the filamentosa that is uh, clade uh, uh, Okay, so uh, sorry, there is some uh, match has happened here. Okay, so filamentosa, which is actually the uh, clade one species. Okay, and apsara, the red. Uh, so the red actually, uh, yeah, actually I have made a mistake over here. This red should have been blue, and uh, 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 yeah. Uh, okay, so this filamentosa they belong to the first clade. So in Sita River, you can see there is a fish from the clade one, and also there is a, another fish from the clade two. And both these fish we found in the same river system at the same time. Okay, similarly in the Netravati river system, there is uh, Daukensha Krasa, there is Daukensha filamentosa. So those are highlighted in the blue uh, lines uh, in the blue font. So they were from the this uh, clade one. Okay, and uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, and we also found another species uh, in the same Netravati river system, but it was falling into the clade two. So this is uh, the clade two uh, species, which is Daukensha. It assimilates this, and in the Moathopola river, again similar pattern we found. We found the species from clade one as well as from the clade two. Uh, similarly, we found in the Chalpodi, in Kaveri, we found three species, there's Arulia, Surubrotinta, Filamentosa from the same river system, from the same clade, and Lepida, which is from the another clade. So why it is, uh, uh, you know, why it was uh, happening? Certainly, we, real, we realized that molecular tree, they are this, uh, uh, this fish, which looks similar, they are quite different. They are totally different from each other, uh, each other. So to uh, you know investigate uh, this matter, we carried out uh, complete uh, thorough reinvestigation of our all specimens, almost more than 500, maybe up to 600 specimens. We run through the uh, you know uh, we gave a clear uh, you know thorough investigation on each and every species, and then we realized that this uh, particular here you go, this uh, clade two species they have. Uh, a very unique character, which is of uh, inferior mouth. And in the clade one, we have all the species which has either terminal or the subterminal mouth, but not the inferior mouth. Uh, also, another fact we realized that in clade two species, you can actually see over here. Yeah, so you can actually see here this first uh, species which I have mentioned as a, a it actually belongs to the clade two. So okay, which has the long uh, barbells. Okay, and this clade two species, there is this uh, clade two species which has this small barbells, and that does not go beyond the vertical line from the posterior margin of the eye. So uh, clade two species, they have the, we realized that this clade two species, they have these two distinct characters. They have inferior mouth and they have the long barbells. Whereas the clade one, they have minute barbells and they have either terminal or subterminal uh, or terminal or subterminal mouth. Okay. So uh, we were quite sure that uh, this is quite uh, we, uh, this is quite weird. And to analyze it further, we uh, de uh, carried out the osteological uh, analysis of this one. So we clear and stain some specimens, and uh, then we studied the osteology of this one. We have not yet published this osteology because we are working on uh, we are working on it, and maybe in future we will come up with uh, another paper on this. So all this uh, clade one, uh, the osteology of this clade one fish are, is totally different, uh, especially the mouth parts, they are totally di different from these uh, clade two species. So here you can clearly see that this clade one uh, species, they have the terminal mouth and this second one has 
little bit of subterminal mouth and this clade 2 they have completely inferior mouths okay and quite a long long barbell so we'll say some in some fish we found uh, small barbells but in general in that population the barbells were quite quite long okay so uh, uh, okay so uh, so after uh, going through uh, this uh, after going through this we uh, started looking at uh, all these uh, different groups and then we classified uh, uh, the entire uh, you know genus we classified entire genus into you know uh, into these two different clades so uh, so instead of describing filamentous and aru instead of classifying this daukensia into the filamentous and arulis group we classified them into a completely new groups that is first is filamentous groups that includes arulius as well and there is a separate group called assimilis group and we use this term assimilis because uh, in this group the daukensia assimilis is the uh, is the is the uh, eldest species or the eldest species i will say yeah so that's why we use this uh, term as assimilis assimilis group so in filamentosa now there are nine species total and in clade 2 there are about uh, four species that we recognize uh, okay and this filamentosa group uh, so uh, this filamentous grub is quite widely distributed as compared to the clade clade two species. This clade two species usually you will see only in the southern western Ghat, and they are restricted to the uh, only uh, you know southern parts of the western Ghats of India. They are thought they, you will not find any of assimilis group species in the Sri Lanka. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so we were sure about this uh, classification. So after segregating all these species in these two different clades, we went for the uh, for the species description. Okay, so there were some uh, there were uh, other uh, there were other taxonomical problems we face in the in the uh, species description. Okay, so okay, so I will again go through this previous slide where I have yes. So if you see over here in this slide, I have mentioned the river name. And in the river name, I have mentioned these two different clade species. Okay, so for example, in Sita River, there is filamentosa, there is apsara as well. In Netravati, there is Daukensia crassa, there is Daukensia filamentosa. So this is from the uh, uh, first uh, clade uh, and Daukensia assimilis. This is from the, from the assimilis clade. So uh, what does it indicate is that uh, we have all these species are the syntopic fish species. So for example, when we found the Daukensia apsara, we also found uh, filamentosa over there. When we found Daukensia assimilis in Netravati, we also found Krasa and filamentosa in the same habitat, in the same river system. And they live together, literally. So we don't know exactly how they, uh, you know, cop up with each other and how they avoid uh, niche competition or the reproductive, how they maintain the reproductive isolation, we don't know yet. Someone can take this topic for the for their PhD, and they can do a fantastic study on this, uh, you know, on this uh, behavioral aspects of this feline boss, so which is very interesting. Okay, and most of the syntopic fish species we have seen in the southern western cuts. So, uh, Yes, so uh, in the Daukensia, so in the same river system, for example, take an example as a Netravati, there was this Daukensia assimilis species, uh, and there was Dauk uh, uh, there was uh, another new species in that, which we describe as Daukensia crassa, and there was Daukensia filamentosa. Okay, and for lame and Sai, this all these three species, all these three species, that is Daukensia assimilis, filamentosa, and crassa, they will look you know, similar to each other. For example, take an example here. Here I have uh, shown here the Daukensia. This is uh, Daukensia filamentosa. This is Krasa. And below here is a Daukensia assimilis. So for a, for a layman's side, they can be just the uh, same species, you know, for untrained eyes, I will say. But if you look, go into deep into the characters, then you can realize that there are these uh, taxonomic uh, characters which separates them apart from each other, okay? So um, I will talk more about here Daukensia assimilis. So what was the problem with Daukensia assimilis? So in uh, Daukensia assimilis was described by the uh, by the Gerardon in 1849 uh, as a Cystobus assimilis. And there were no types because uh, for most of Gerardon's uh, description, there are no, uh, we don't have the types or they are not available. Okay, so uh, there was no types for this uh, uh, for this uh, uh, species assimilis. Uh, we did not validate it. Actually, this species was validated by the uh, Pethia Gauda and Portela 2005. So in their in, in, in their revision of this filamentous group of fish, 
uh, uh, you know, they validated identity of this, uh, uh, you know, Netravati fish that is as uh, Asimilis, as Daukinsha Asimilis. Okay. But what happened was, uh, 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 was, uh, was that uh, they also provided the, they also provided, they provide, they, uh, you know, validated uh, Daukinsha Asimilis from Netravati, but they also provided records of this species from this Chalkudi. Uh, Netravati River of Karnataka, but they also provided records of these species from the Chalkudi and Kalda rivers of the Kerala. So, uh, so these Chalkudi and Kalda, Kalda rivers, they are totally different river system. Okay, one thing you have to uh, remember here that uh, I'm talking about the waste flowing rivers in the Western Ghats, okay, in the Western catchment. So they are not connected with each, which, uh, each other at all. Okay, each species is different and it represents a completely different uh, river system. So Netravati has no connection with Chalkudi and Chalkudi has no connection with the with the Kalda, uh, Kalda river. So what happened was uh, while validating the identity of this Daukensha Asimilis, so uh, Pete and Kotal 2005, they mentioned this uh, fish from the Chalkudi as well as from the Kalda, uh, Kalda river. river. So uh, we, uh, of course, we collected the fish from the Chalkudi and the Kalda River in our sampling, and we <clears throat> then we realized that uh, uh, you know uh, from the morphology and from the molecular uh, tree, we realized that this uh, 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 Chalkudi and the Kalda fish is actually a different. So here is the Chalkudi River fish. So this fish is totally different. It's actually a new species, and we describe it as a new species. And there is another uh, fish from the uh, from from the uh, this one, from the uh, from the Asimilis group. So this, <coughs> uh, uh, so uh, we found these two uh, uh, species over there, and they were not showing any similarities with the Asimilis from the Netravati River. Okay, so what we did was, uh, so in uh, amid of this uh, chaos, it was necessary to set the, you know, type for this uh, species. Okay, so there are certain rules when it comes to the, uh, you know, if 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 you have if uh, if there is no type uh, for the for the uh, for the old species, then there are certain rules you have to follow. You have to follow the ICZ codes for it, and then you have to assign uh, the, uh, you know, assign the type for it. So in this case, we designated a new type. Uh, uh, but uh, you know you have to assign the you can assign the neotype when there is a need to do so if there is no need to assign the neotype then uh, you know you have to uh, you have to judge over uh, this one whether there is really a need to assign the neotype or not yeah, in this case it was necessary to assign the neotype because in the same river system as i told you earlier in the netravati uh, we found uh, more than uh, one daukensia so there was need to set the identity of uh, this fish okay so uh, okay so we set the neotype for this fish and then we uh, validated the distribution of this fish is the uh, is that and uh, as uh, it is only found in the netravati river system of southern karnataka okay uh, so this is about the assimilis barb. So this is true assimil assimilis barb from the Netravati river. Okay, this fish is in uh, real life, this fish actually looks blue, quite blue. So you can call it the blue daukensia as well. Yeah, okay, we use, uh, we use the common name as assimilis barb for this. Okay, so uh, even, even even today, if you type, uh, if you search this species, Daukensia assimilis, okay, uh, most of the results you will see over here is of weird fish, okay, it is kind of yellowish fish with the red line in the center that runs almost parallel to the lateral line and there is a, a you know, kind of uh, mascara uh, on the, on the eyes, so there is a, uh, this typical kind of uh, blotch over there behind the eyes. So this fish will pop up in the in the Google search if you search on the internet. So why this is happening? Because uh, uh, because uh, for so many years people considered this uh, fish. So this fish with red line is actually from a Sita river. Okay, this is also from the Assimilis group. Uh, Assimilis group. Uh, but it is a very, it is completely different species. It has, uh, it is a sister species of Assimilis, but it is a very unique species. It is a very different uh, species. 
Okay. So, uh, uh, so it was, uh, I mean, it is a clear misidentification and people have misidentified it for so many uh, years in the, in the trade and they treated it as a mascara bar and they used the name as Dawkins Assimilis, but it is not uh, Assimilis, it is actually the new species that we discussed, which is Apsara, Dawkins Apsara. So what happened was, Yes. So when we uh, collected this uh, uh, amazing, beautiful fish from the Sita uh, River, and then we realized that this fish from the Sita, which was uh, popularly known as the Okinsha Assimilis in the trade, is actually a very different uh, species. So we designated, since it is the most beautiful Daukensia in the in the, uh, the most beautiful species in the Daukensia, we designated the name as Apsara. Okay, so Apsara, uh, that is, you know, uh, it uh, represents the list, uh, you know, it uh, represents the list in beauty. Since it is the most beautiful fish, therefore we use the term Apsara. And uh, uh, currently it is distributed in Sita River as well as in the Sauparnika Saupar, River. So we uh, got the population from Sita River as well as we found the population from the Sauparnika River. So this is the distribution of this, uh, uh, this Apsara bar. Okay. Okay, so while describing uh, uh, this, uh, uh, while validating the Daukensia Asimilis from Netravati River, we also come across to another uh, new species from this, uh, from the same river system, that is Netravati River. Okay, but it was not from the uh, uh, Asimilis complex, it belonged to the first clade, and that is the Filamentosa clade. So we, this fish is more related to the Daukensia Filamentosa, uh, Filamentosa, uh, 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 as compared to the Daukensia assimilis. So it belongs to the filamentosa species group. Okay, so that we described from the Netravati river. And again, the co-occurring species here, you can see that Daukensia filamentosa, and it co-occurs with filamentosa and the Daukensia assimilis. So it lives in syntopy with both these uh, two, with both these species, filamentosa as well as assimilis. Okay, and we named it commonly, uh, we gave the common name as rounded filament barbs because it is the Daukensia we found which has the more, more body tape okay okay so this is uh, okay so after setting the identity or after setting the new type for daukensia assimilis it was necessary to look at the records of daukensia assimilis from the uh, chalukudi and from the muathapola river systems okay those reports were uh, given by the uh, uh, pete gauda and kotela 2005 so when we look at uh, this uh, 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 fish, uh, you know, Daukensha australis, we quickly realize that it is something something different, very different. Because you can see over here, if you look at the caudal peduncle blotch, so this is a blotch on the caudal peduncle, it is not a regular uh, caudal uh, peduncle blotch. Okay, so you can see that the diamond shaped, uh, you can see the diamond shaped pattern, it's made of or made up of diamond shaped patterns, okay, so which is very different from the rest of uh, Daukensia, so be it Daukensia filamentous or the assimilis complex species, okay. So we uh, describe this new species as Daukensia australis, and it is the southernmost uh, uh, species uh, of the assimilis complex, therefore, we named it as a Southern filament parts, and it is found in the Muathapura as well as in the uh, as well as in the Chalkodi river systems of Kerala. Okay, so here is uh, the paratype which I have uh, showed here on this slide. That is paratype which is in Sri Lanka now, but it has been collected from the Chalkodi river in Kerala. And this was the paratype collected uh, uh, paratype which was used by the Pete Gowda Portal 2005 in their comprehensive study. So in their study, they uh, you know identified it as Daukensha assim. Well, of course it was because that time they didn't use the molecular techniques. And, uh, you know, this, that's why I'm telling you that, uh, you know, you need to uh, consider the molecular uh, techniques as well as the morphological techniques, because only after using the integrative approach, your, you know, the classification can make, makes the uh, sense. Otherwise it will, otherwise, you know, morphology can fool you literally. Uh, literally okay so uh, this uh, uh, okay so this specimen was used by uh, was earlier identified as daukensia assimilis from the chalkudi river in so in our study what we did was we assigned this uh, specimen uh, as a paratype of daukensia australis so this is this is how we have validated uh, this is we have corrected the record of assimilis from the chalkudi river system okay Okay, 
So now there is another species that is uh, Daukensia lepida, which was described by the day in the 1868. Okay, which was described as the Portuintius or the Copeta lepidus by the day in 1868. So, um, uh, I, you know, there was uncertainty on uh, this uh, species, whether it is a valid species or it is a, uh, or, uh, or, or it is just a synonym of uh, some filamentosus or some other species. So, uh, in earlier literature, you can say it was synonymized to the Printius filamentosus, okay, by the Menon 1999, and it was synonymized to uh, to the Assimilis by the Pethe Gouda uh, Portela 2005, so in their, in their revision. Uh, revision. So, uh, and this, uh, 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 you know, uh, in, in their revision, they, uh, 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 but in this, in their revision, Petagauda and Cotella uh, 2005, they have specifically mentioned that uh, this fish has, you know, uh, uh, kind of lower mouth, kind of inferior mouth, and it shares the similarity with the assimilis from the Chalkudi river. Okay, so so that you can see that uh, even they have noticed this character that is inferior mouth or the uh, lower mouth. Okay, so uh, so of course in our molecular tree it has come out separately. So we were quite sure that it is a you know this species from the Kaveri is uh, you know is a different. Uh, uh, is a totally a different species, and it was described from the uh, days. I mean, Francis Day described it from the Bowani River at Metabolium, which is actually a Bowani River, which is a tributary of uh, Kaveri River system. Okay, uh, but okay, this again belongs to the Assimilis uh, species complex because it has the inferior mouth, but it is the only species in the Assimilis complex which can be found in the east flowing and the west flowing river systems as well. So for example, it is found in the Moatopola and Chalkudi rivers of Kerala. These two river systems are the west flowing river system and the, in the Bhavani river. Bhavani is the uh, tributary of Kaveri river system. So this is the east flowing river system. So in, in whole Assimilis complex, Lepida is the, Daukensia Lepida is the most widely distributed species. Okay, uh, is the most widely distributed species uh, that I can uh, like what I can call it. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, about, so in our uh, paper, we uh, validated the identity of Daukensia lepida. We did here, we didn't, um, you know, we didn't um, uh, designated a new type as there was no need because, uh, 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 because, you know, there was survive, there is surviving material that, that has been listed as a syntypes. So there are syntypes in the British Museum and we use those syntypes as a material to study, but we dis didn't designate a new type for this as there was no need to do, do so, okay. Uh, there is another species that we described and which is from the Northern Western Ghats. Okay, so all these descriptions which I showed you, those were from the Southern Western Ghats and this is again a unique uh, species. Okay, so in Southern Western Ghats, you saw that uh, this uh, two or three different uh, Daukensias, they are living together, okay, in Syntopy. So Syntopy is a kind of, uh, you know, uh, is a kind of special uh, I will say a special, uh, special sympatric relationship, okay, where uh, two species, they're not just, uh, you know, where, where the two species from the same genus, they co-occur uh, at the same time. So they, sometimes they share the shoals as well. So sometimes they live in the same shoal as well, okay. So this is, uh, again, a kind of unique example, but here, um, uh, yeah, uh, but here, this, uh, you know, this new species, which we describe as Daukensia uttara, uh, it lives in the, you, you know, uh, you can, uh, it is a sister species of Daukensia filamentosa. In the same river system, you will find these two species, okay, Daukensia uttara and uh, Daukensia filamentosa. But it is more restricted to the upstream catchment areas or the upper catchment areas of the river. And in this region, the filamentosa is restricted to the lowland areas, okay, to the, uh, to in the paddy fields and in the lowland river systems. Okay, so there is clear cut, uh, uh, you know, a geographical uh, separation that has happened for these two species. So this is, this does not live with syntopy uh, with filamentosa, but it both you can find the, both the species in the same river system. How they are separated from uh, from each other, or how they maintain the geographic isolation, we have no idea. Probably the altitude factor uh, might be contributing to it, but it has to be studied. Uh, you know, someone has to study it. Okay. 
uh, yes. And for this species, again, we compare it with the filamentosa. We use completely different morphological approach. We uh, use, uh, you know, we saw the, uh, we use the different characters as well, where we saw the, how the bands on this caudal fin. So Daukensia, uh, it is not actually the character of Daukensia. Uh, because this character is found in Sayadriya as well as in Daukensia, where you will see the, uh, you know, uh, uh, bands on the caudal fin tips. Okay, so in Daukensia, there is a red, uh, uh, there is a black band that was under uh, and, uh, and following uh, the red band. Uh, so in different species, you will see the variations in those in those bands and you know, it, uh, okay and while describing this particular species Daukensia uttara we studied this uh, patterns in uh, uh, in much uh, depth actually okay and this can actually uh, help you to identify the uh, these patterns can actually help you to identify different species as well okay so uh, so this is how we uh, describe this uh, different species throughout the western cards and after uh, you know after all this uh, investigation and the reinvestigation we uh, 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 you know we uh, come up with a distribution maps for for daukensia so first let's have a look at the filamentosa species group okay so you can see over here that uh, uh, the filamentosa species group okay is uh, filamentosa species group that means the species group which has uh, terminal or the subterminal mouth and a minute uh, barbells okay and this group is uh, more widely distributed in the western Ghats. in fact it starts from north of mumbai till the uh, till the uh, till the sri lanka actually okay so uh, so see here uh, yeah, and all those white spots we have shown, they, they represent a filamentosa. So Daukensia filamentosa is the most widely distributed species in the peninsula, in the Western Ghats of India and uh, Sri Lanka as well. Uh, okay, another interesting thing we found in our study that uh, there was uh, 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 there was a species called Daukensia singhala from the Sri Lanka. Okay, uh, and it was a valid species till uh, we come up with our uh, study. We realized that Daukensia singhala is genetically similar to the Daukensia filamentosa that we have recorded from uh, from, uh, from from the peninsular India. So uh, there was uh, just uh, there was very minute uh, genetic distance, very less genetic distance. So we treated this Daukensia singala from Sri Lanka as a synonym of uh, you know as a, a synonym of uh, Daukensia filamentosa. So that makes Daukensia filamentosa even more widely distributed species. So it found in the Western Ghats of India as well as in the Sri Lanka, as well as in the Eastern Ghats. So you can actually see over here, in the, even in the Eastern Ghats, it is uh, distributed. And probably it is the only species probably dis which has records from the Eastern Ghats. Okay? Okay. Another fact is, uh, 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 among this filamentosa species group, there are certain species which are only found in the west flowing river systems, and there are uh, some species which are only found in the east flowing river system. So, as I mentioned here, Daukensia filamentosa can be found everywhere. You know, you will get Daukensia filamentosa in east as well as in the west flowing river systems. Okay, but there are some specific uh, species which are limited to the one or uh, maybe two or three uh, river and systems, but they are highly endemic, like Daukensia Krasa, Daukensia Exclamatio, then Daukensia Rohani, Daukensia Uttara. They are only found in the west flowing river and systems. And uh, there, uh, there is another group of fish called Arulius, Rubrotinta, Tamraparni. They are found in the east flowing river systems. And all this, uh, and uh, Arulius and Rubrotinta, they are known from the Kaveri river system. And Tamraparni is known from this Tamraparni river here in the, which is here in the south in Tamil Nadu. Okay, so this is distribution of the filamentosa species group. Let's have a look at the distribution of assimili species group. Okay, so in the uh, uh, assimili species group, as I mentioned earlier, there are only four species. Okay, so Daukensia, uh, and among them, Daukensia apsara, assimilis, and australis. Uh, these three species are found only exclusively in the west flowing river system, whereas only the Daukensia lepida you will get which is distributed in east as well as west flowing river systems uh, okay so in east uh, yeah, it is found in the kaveri which is east flowing river system in tamil nadu and it is also found in the kerala in the west flowing river systems here okay so this is the distribution of uh, you know daukensia in uh, peninsular india and sri lanka 
Okay. So how the uh, integrative taxonomy has uh, helped us uh, to come up with, uh, you know, uh, come up with this new species description as well as, uh, you know, different uh, results. So uh, let's have a look at the results. So this integrative, uh, you know, because since we use the molecular techniques, okay, and as well as the, the uh, traditional morphological approach with the osteological studies, we realize that, uh, you know, this fish, um, they are, uh, uh, you know, they can be classified in completely two different clades or two different groups. So, which was previously unknown. So, it is a complete new classification we come up with. So that they are distributed in the two groups, that is filamentosa and uh, assimilis. You can also refer it to the complex as well if you want. Want. And uh, we describe uh, the four new species in the study, that is Apsara, Ostelus, Taukensha Krasa, and this Taukensha Uttara from the Northern Western Ghats. We synonymize Singala with the filamentosa. So Singala is from the Sri, uh, is the species uh, which is known from the Sri Lanka, but it has, uh, you know, uh, it, it's very similar to the filamentosa and it has very less genetic distance, very minor genetic distance. So we synonymize it with filamentosa. Then we resurrected the Daukensha lepida from the synonymy of uh, Daukensha assibilis. So this Daukensha lepida was in synonym, synonymy with uh, Daukensha assibilis. So we resurrected that. And also we validated the identity and distribution of Daukensha assibilis from the Netravati river. So this is the result from this, uh, you know, from this whole uh, investigation of this Daukensha. So now after all this investigation, now we have to, uh, num number of valid species in the Western Ghats and Sri Lanka is 13. So we have total 13 valid species, but you know, uh, we have yet, yet we have not surveyed all waste flowing river systems in Kerala and in uh, Karnataka as well. And once we have more collection or if we get more collection in future, I'm sure that this number will, will, uh, will increase. Or if uh, anyone do the uh, study, not just us, but uh, not just me, but anyone can, uh, if they work on this particular group of fish, I'm sure that this number will go up. Okay, because uh, there are there are still many more species they are waiting to to get uh, described. Okay, so these are the results from this uh, whole Daukensia investigation. Okay, so I'm almost done with my presentation here, but I will take you quickly through. Uh, uh, yeah, through these uh, slides, okay, through these sum of pictures of our, um, you know, of the field site. So you can actually have a look at uh, the field sites and you can actually uh, realize that from where we have collected this fish. Okay, so this river is actually a Sita river. This is the type locality of Apsara, so which uh, we visited in the 2016. Uh, and this is the Apsara bath that uh, we got it from uh, here. So actually this fish, this uh, original specimen was, uh, this original fish was collected by Dr. Ralph Fritz when he came to, uh, came to India and we, uh, when he joined us for the, for our Karnataka expedition. So he collected the fish over there, uh, Nikhil Sut from India Gills, one of my best friends. He was also with uh, Ralph, I guess Anwar from Kifos and C.B. Philip uh, was also with uh, him. So they both, uh, we joined them uh, in the Amboni. And in, in Maharashtra, he showed me this uh, beautiful fish and it was just stunning. So that time I was not even thinking of Tautensia. So I was not sure about what kind of this species is, but Ralph was sure that this, this is quite different and that, you know, then, it, uh, then this species came to reality. So thanks to Ralph for giving me this picture and showing me this beautiful species from Sita River. And to Nikhil as well for helping us to get the collection from this uh, beautiful river system. Okay. So then, uh, okay. So this is, uh, uh, okay, this is Muatapula River. So uh, this is the first site that I visited in. Uh, so this was my first trip in Kerala, actually. And this was my first visit as well to Kerala, in, well, which I made in 2013, where, where I joined with my friend Fibin, Fibin uh, baby. So he is, uh, uh, so he's, uh, he's from Kerala and he and he, some of his friends, they joined me and we went for the, for the fish surveys over there. Uh, and that was the first expedition. Okay. And this is the river from where I collected, uh, collected almost, where we collected almost three species 
in a single cast net. So uh, Fabian's friend was there. He threw a cast net in in this uh, you know big uh, river system. It is actually a deep river system because uh, you know it's a, actually a middle section of the river. Okay, so he threw a cast net, and within a single throw, we got uh, uh, lots of dauncia. And in those cache, there were three species. So there was dauncia filamentosa. There was Daukensia ostellus and there was Daukensia lepida. So here you go. So this is Daukensia ostellus. Okay, and this picture, which uh, uh, the of Daukensia ostellus is uh, is the uh, picture that I have immediately captured. You know, this is the picture that I have taken immediately after collection. So you can actually see that this fish had some iridescent blue color, and that is actually to do because when we collected this fish, I I could see that this fish they have. a uh, you know very typical blue tinge which you can't see in in the in the first image because it has it is it, it has gone okay because it has gone we put this fish in the aquarium and then we took this first image but when we we draw this fish or collected this fish from uh, when we removed this fish from net cast net immediately we saw that they were they were shining blue literally and there was other species we another species we got that is daukensia lepida so it was just dull uh, species it was not that beautiful and we got daukensia filamentosa as well so these three species they were they were uh, we caught them in the in a single throw in a single cast net and from a same locality so you can imagine that how weird these uh, fish are that these three different species they are they can be found in the same river system in at the same locality at the same time that means they are coexisting together uh, right but uh, uh, you know how they are maintaining this uh, this uh, you know species boundaries or the uh, or the reproductive boundaries is yet unknown and this can be a fantastic topic if someone is interested to uh, study this group of fish and uh, and this is not just the one case okay here uh, it is a completely different uh, fish it is a pethia it is not at all daukensia it has no relation with daukensia at all but it is now but this syntopic relationship we have also observed in the pethia and this is the first pethia first syntopic pethia that we described in 2018 from uh, from amboli so pethia sahit this new species and the pethia longicola that also we described in 2014 from the same locality from amboli they can be found in the same shoal so actually this picture is not very clear because it's so tiny uh, i'm not sure if you will be able to trace out but you can actually see that i have marked here the uh, mark those fish with the yellow arrows that is pethia sahit and those mark with the white arrows they are actually pethia longicoda so these two species they coexist together they live in the syntopic relationship uh, and yet they are very different and even in this fish the genetic distance is almost like 14 to 16% so which is huge okay and they are not at all even though they are in pethia they are not at all related to each other they are very two different uh, species so yes so this is the fabian which i mentioned you earlier in the slide so he was there with me in 2013 when we when we carried out surveys across the uh, chalkudi and the mohatpur river and this is his friend and uh, this is not uh, yeah we are, this is the lower uh, regions the lower reach of uh, mohatpura river uh, so actually in kerala you can uh, see you know uh, everywhere you will see water because there is back water everywhere and in those uh, among those back waters there is all uh, there is only this uh, you know uh, there are there are not really roads but these are just pathways that these people they have made okay and it is quite difficult to take a four wheel over uh, i mean the uh, the car over there or uh, uh, or vehicle over there so instead using the car we chose to you know uh, we uh, 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 travel with this uh, auto rickshaw you know this mahindra tuk tuk which was quite awesome we had some uh, you know uh, bumpy ride but it was fantastic and this is uh, uh, this is from again from the from the lower reaches of the mouth of pola river which uh, further joins to the webnard lake okay this is from the 2013 okay so this is the first trip when i joined my uh, uh, my uh, mentor uh, uh, my co guide dr nilesh dhanakar so this was our first uh, field trip from sindhurga we also got some interesting uh, filamentosa uh, over here and uh, other species that we later describe as daukensia uttara well 
and this is uh, these are some other uh, some more pictures from the from the next expedition from the same locality that's from the Amboli and again in same in the same period 2013 so you can actually see over here how we carry all these equipments and the, all those uh, collection bottles and how we transport the fish from you know how we collect fish and how we transport so this is like uh, this is like you know uh, so I turned my car into something like you know like uh, like uh, like uh, camping van or something something like that so it was full of specimens yes so this is from the 2016 uh, the picture from the 2016 expedition where i joined uh, uh, dr raju raghun so he is my mentor from uh, qfos and uh, uh, pradeep is also there uh, here and dr nilesh danukar as well and there is uh, this two ladies there from uh, priyanka is there and kirti they are from the uh, from the zoo wild so this was again all uh, fantastic uh, experience that I had, and this is the expedition where uh, you know we collected uh, Daukensha apsara from uh, from the uh, Shoparnika river system in Karnataka. So again, this is uh, from the Northern Western Ghats where uh, Dr. Ralph Bridge joined us in the Northern Western Ghats to collect fish. Uh, then he visited the Bombay Natural History Society in the museum, and we were going through some uh, some specimens over there. Uh, yes, and this was the fantastic expedition. These two guys, the middle, the, the one in the middle is Eldo, and on the right hand side is the Anup. So Anup is my classmate actually. So we joined for PhD program in the same uh, same year. So he's my classmate, and we went for the uh, Periyar expedition in 2006, uh, 2017. And it was such a fantastic uh, expedition. You know, it was in the, really in the core area of the Peria Tiger Reserve. We collected some amazing fish over there. Uh, we had some great experience as well. We saw elephants, tigers. So it was like you know, uh, it was like in the dense forest where you know you have to collect the fish, uh, but you have to also keep a watch on uh, those animals. Uh, you never know that when tiger or elephants they will show. Okay, so. And there were bug marks everywhere along the stream. So it was quite a terrible experience we had over there. Okay. So this is from our recent expedition in the Karnataka, uh, sorry, in the Kerala, that is Northern Kerala. Again, with Dr. Balpish Anup is uh, there. You can see over here. Okay. And uh, in my work, I mean, while working on all this fish and on uh, different projects through the BNHS and through the PFOS as well. I also come across to the, uh, you know, uh, to local people where I, uh, you know, where I interacted with them. And it, it's always good, you know, when you work on field, you have to interact with the local people and you should always keep in keep that in mind because, uh, you know, these are the, these local people or the local fishermen, they are the stakeholders of uh, these river and systems. And they know very well where to find, you know, which uh, fish. So if you need a particular kind of fish or particular kind of species, you must, you have to have contact with them. And it's always good to, you know, keep interaction with local people and then work in the, in the, in the area. Okay. So, uh, yes. And this is from uh, my last, uh, from, from my uh, visit to the Natural History Museum, London. So while working on this, uh, the, the different group of fish, I also got uh, some nice opportunities, some fantastic opportunity to visit different museums, to visit different institutions through the, through the conferences. So this is from, uh, this is only from uh, fish section of the Natural History Museum. And this is here with me with uh, Dr. Ron Pritz in front of Natural History Museum gates. Okay, in the same uh, trip in 2019, I was there for SCCS uh, conference, student conference on conservation science. I attended this 2019 conference and where I got the opportunity to, to meet Sir David Attenborg as well. So we interacted with him and it was a very nice uh, experience. And this is my lab. So this is our molecular systematics and jump plus lab. We call it Raju's lab at uh, QFOS. So this is the picture that we took in 2017. So there are almost, uh, there are, uh, yeah, there are, uh, some people are missing or Anup is missing or probably he must be behind camera, I guess. So this is our lab from QFOS and I will end this uh, presentation here with uh, saying thanks to you all. And also want to thanks to my peers as well, Dr. Raju Raghuvan, my mentor, my co-guide, Dr. Nilesh Rahanukar for, uh, you know, for the, for the uh, thorough guidance 
to the Dr. Ralph Breeds as well for teaching me the new methodologies and introducing me to, uh, to the you know concepts of taxonomy to the and to the uh, osteology in in specific. Uh, I also thank Dr. Rohan Petegoda and Kiran as well for uh, providing us the you know great help while writing the manuscripts, especially Dr. Rohan Petegoda because uh, uh, his critics and his critical comments has really improved our work. Uh, so we. Uh, so I specifically thank him for uh, giving us all guidance and I also thank my other co-authors Anoop uh, as well and Marcus Knight as well. So Marcus shared some specimens from the southern India so which was of big uh, help and finally I would like to give a thanks to my, uh, to my friend Nikhil. So he is a founder of India Gills. So he is the one who actually provided us the specimens of uh, Daukinsha Asimilis from the Netravati, Netravati River and Daukinsha Apsara, specimens of Daukinsha Apsara as well. And he has accompanied us in different expeditions as well. So big thanks to him as well for always helping us out with the specimens. Yes, so on the, so yes, so that was all about uh, it. And if you're interested, we have actually, we have on our uh, website, uh, uh, sorry, on our uh, official YouTube channel of the Bombay National History Society, we have uploaded a documentary, a short documentary on uh, on uh, on our research. Okay, uh, while this you know this documentary is all about describing filament buffs. So it will be named it as Biodiversity Unveiled: Discovering the Filament Buffs. So Biodiversity Unveiled is a series, and in that series we had this first film out that is discovering the filament buffs. So if you are interested, you can actually go through the, this documentary. I will put the link to this documentary in the chat section or in the comment box over here. So you can just copy it and then you can go, go through it. So yes, thank you all. And if you are, uh, if you want to contact me, feel free to contact me on this, uh, my official email address. So yes, thank you all. That's Thanks very much, Unmesh. Uh, um, first of all, I apologize my, uh, my voice was breaking uh, when I was introducing you, uh, Nish. Uh, but anyway, thanks very much for the excellent talk. And uh, thanks for all who joined today for the talk. Uh, before we go to discussion, please provide us with, uh, with the feedback about today's talk. I have put the link in the chat box. So please take one minute to fill in that uh, form and I can pass that info to Unmesh. <laughs> um, and we are always looking to expand our coordinator network. So if we can help us circulate our talks, we would like to hear from you. Just send us an email to afstalks at gmail.com. Uh, so let's move into the discussion part. Uh, uh, we already have crossed uh, more than an hour, uh, but we give 15 minutes for discussion. Please use the hand raise feature. And also, uh, if you get a chance, please type the question in the chat box. And so everyone can read whatever it is. Uh, so uh, I'll give people to respond to that for a, a minute, and while that, I will just um, you know I will pass my question for you, for you. Um, I I like the uh, like you mentioned about the linear shortfall and Valencian shortfall because most times we see people I mean we see many species have been discovered, but the efforts to actually map them geographically the geographical distribution is not that much effort has gone into it. And uh, I think uh, when you look at the conservation, you know, efforts, you know, that's essentially what you need, you know, you need to know where they are, conserve them. Um, so, um, and especially when coming to the uh, filamentous uh, complex or whatever, you know, Everyone in in this uh, in the audience probably are wondering about that work because we only knew, uh, you know, a filament bar with the blotch and the coral pedangle. Everything was just produced filament dosa, and now we can see there are nine species uh, <laughs> floating around, <laughs> and and that's really probably a shock for all of us. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but the point is uh, the same. What was being thought as one species has been used as food, and you know, they are harvested for as a food species and also as an ornamental species. So there's a lot of fishing pressure on those populations. So in yeah. your uh, expeditions, what what is your thinking about how how many of these populations are probably depleted? You know, 
like you know are they you know what kind of indication do you get when you on to all these surveys are they very severe are we on the edge on you know breaking them uh, the ex- their existence that's my first question i have a second question in general what do you see what are the bottlenecks you see when it comes to actually implementing a conservation um, effort uh, you know of course that's go go through a policy but the, Do you see how difficult they are to actually implement in a country like us, where there's a huge human population and they are all depend on river systems for their livelihood? Right. So, uh, thanks, Deepak. Uh, uh, okay. So, I will. Uh, so, how how should I address all these questions? So, I will first start with the with the fishery perspective, right? That's the first thing you ask, right? So, uh, yes. So, these filament barbs. okay i forgot to mention probably in my in my talk that uh, they are uh, you know um, they are very tasty and very edible fish so they also, they contribute quite heavily to the local fishery so if you go in kerala you will see filament barb uh, you know you will see the uh, like mountains of filament barbs in the morning on the landing station so they are very popular in in uh, mostly in the lower rich, lower you know lowland areas of the kerala so yes they contribute quite heavily to the inland fishery to the local fishery uh, in kerala yes i am sure about that i'm not sure about karnataka maybe in sada southern karnataka karnataka they might be contributing to the to the local fishery in maharashtra people don't really eat this people eat this very very occasionally um, but in uh, you know uh, Uh, so this is all uh, this is about the fishery perspective and once with, uh, you ask also about the extinction right uh, extinction yeah, well, what's the feel you get yeah i have seen the yeah. trends in population trends yeah having related. having discovered nine species in that trivially thought as one no. species yeah. what do yeah. you think you know on the fishing pressure on these populations mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. no as so actually one thing is that we do not have information on this on the population trend so i even i can't talk about it okay uh, but to my personal experience no i have not seen such trend i have never seen species they are you know found in very less number because everywhere you go you will find plenty of filament barbs and that is one reason is because of their spawning spawning capacity their spawning rate because they spawn in very high quantity i guess and i'm not i have, don't have much knowledge on their breeding biology but i'm sure that they spawn heavily quite heavily and they have the breeding season in the monsoon uh, as well as in the uh, you know uh, as well as in the post monsoon period so there are two seasons they overlap so that's uh, my experience with uh, the uh, this uh, filament barbs okay and the next question was about the further uh, what further can we do about the uh, uh, you know about this information right so yes so now from this study we have basic information on this uh, uh, on this group right we have we know the species diversity and we know little bit about the uh, about the distribution okay but still uh, uh, by ending this talk i also told you that there is possibility to get more species from this region especially from the kerala and especially from the karnataka and more specifically from the west flowing river systems so there is still uh, scope to describe this new species describe the new knowledge and there is a uh, heavy scope to work on the distribution range of the species because what distribution range i have given is based on my collection okay but there has to be a extensive collection there has to be extensive study to be done on this uh, populations of these different species and then we can have a um, uh, knowledge on extent distribution of this for the particular species so once we have this information then we can use this information to uh, first you know the first step in the uh, in the uh, when it comes to conservation is designating designating them the conservation status and we do, we do that through the iucn red listing okay so um, once we have the information clear information on their distribution we can un- and their population as well then we can uh, carry out the uh, red list assessment for all these all these species and then, uh, and after that we can you know we can specifically talk about that that see daukanshya apsara is limited is restricted to the to the sita river and the shoparnika river and it's only found in this two river systems 
and therefore it has the endangered status or maybe vulnerable status and therefore it has to be on the conservation priority list so wherever we have more endemic species where we have more locally end, uh, endemic species or you know point endemic species we can focus conservation activities yeah. on such areas so, very shortly i was going to ask you about you know the small food uh, fishes like barbs and lodges are favorite food fishes in west bengal and right. uh, do, you, do you think a similar high high level complexity would exist in the northeastern side of the country and yes. uh, yeah and there's probably a huge lack of information there as well absolutely. but i think yes yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely northeast is completely you know is a blank mm. spot for it's yeah. complete blank spot there there are people describe so many species from there i mean i see a lot of descriptions but they are not usually backed up with uh, molecular evidences or the molecular studies yeah so there is scope yeah. to I have a question from Dr. Radhakrishnan. Uh, I will let him uh, speak to you. You can sure. unmute yourself, Radhakrishnan. Hi, Unmesh. Uh, uh, hello, sir. Very, How are you? Yeah, yeah I'm fine. I'm okay, very happy okay, to okay. see you here. Thank you, sir. Uh, very Thank nice. You, sir. Okay. Yeah. Nice to uh, learn from you, in fact. Uh, well, I, I have a few doubts, in fact. Okay. Uh, like um, you were saying that there are two clades within Dawkinsia, Filamentosa group, the other group. Correct. And you were also, of course, uh, morphologically, some differences like barbels. Correct. And uh, you were mentioning the scope or, uh, oh, yeah, inferior and uh, this terminal mouth. Yes, yes. But is it like that some other characters uh, still may be overlapping between these two, two, two clades, uh, morphological overlapping? Okay, that, that, that is my first doubt. Okay. The second doubt is that, um, of course, um, I, my experience during my sampling survey from 2000 to 2005 in Kerala rivers also, we also collected the filament also from different parts. <clears throat> but in fact, we treated them all as filament doses only and later only for the studies by you, it is proved like this. But uh, as you were telling, uh, yes, some of the juvenile sample, we have more color bands and it gradually disappears as an adult. So is it like that um, you have collected different uh, stages of samples for comparing between uh, your different species? And what, I, what I'm more concerned is that is it like there's some color bands or the, the extension of the, the posterior spot? What is the, uh, what you were mentioning? Maybe sometimes uh, it may appear uh, like that in certain life stages or in some other part, maybe it become a round blotch. Is it like that? Have you come across, uh, or in, in in essence, like have you taken the different uh, samples covering the entire life history of the, the species for comparison? So please, thank you, thank you. Okay, for so uh, sir, I will first uh, address your first question that is about the characters. You ask about the overlapping characters. Yeah, right? yeah. So yes. So as I mentioned, there are uh, two clades. Now, we have come up with the two clades. One is filamentosa and one is assimilis. So filamentosa, they have terminal, subterminal mouth and uh, uh, assimilis, they have the, uh, you know, inferior mouth. But, but there is one species that is, uh, for, you know, that is Daukensia Sri Lankensis, which is found in Sri Lanka and it belongs to the filamentosa complex genetically, but it has an inferior mouth. So it is the only odd one out species over there in the filamentosa complex. Okay, so this is uh, again, it, uh, so this character is again comes as an overlapping character over here. But we also, we are also studying some osteological characters. So where we are studying the uh, uh, shape of maxilla, I mean the dentary bones, uh, mouth structures, we are studying the shape of uh, neurocranium as well. And we are st uh, studying the other uh, osteological features. So some characters, yes, they are overlapping in certain species, but uh, there are some other characters, osteological characters that clearly uh, diagnosis these two, these two clades. In fact, these two clades, they, they uh, you know, they maybe in the future, if it is possible at all, and if we get good characters, then maybe it can it can be evaluated as two different genus, probably. All right. Thank you. I think um, yes, you sir. still remember my second yeah. question, or should I? Yes. Repeat? No. No. Yes. Yes. Sorry, I forgot. So, second question was whether I have uh, collected the different stages, uh, different life stages for the same species, right, in my study. Yes. So, uh, 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 
so uh, so uh, whenever we have collected the samples we come across to the juveniles so we have juveniles in our uh, samples as well we have uh, specimens uh, spe we have uh, specimens with uh, you know uh, having the particular life stage where you can see that the bands are they are diminishing and then we have adult stage so for morphology specifically we avoided to uh, you know uh, we avoid to use those uh, small size uh, specimens or the juveniles or the you know those which shows the uh, you know different coloration patterns so we only use the adult specimens for for morphology and this is uh, how we carried out our morphological study uh, but we uh, 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 but the but we uh, i have never seen a variation in uh, this one i have never seen that uh, you know, uh, in filamentosa, uh, for example, in Daukensia filamentosa and filamentosa, uh, the all, all uh, you will see the three bands or the four bands in the juvenile stages, and then this all these vertical bands they just disappear. So, uh, where, whenever we have seen the adult specimens, they don't have this uh, these bands, but we have got some middle stage specimens where we have seen that these bands are little bit, uh, you know, they appear little bit and they are not prominently gone over there. So probably once this, uh, uh, so, so probably after achieving the adult stage, these uh, bands will go, uh, will diminish uh, completely. So this kind of uh, character, this kind of characters we have observed over there, yes. And, but the characters we have only studied is for the, for the adult specimens and not for the juveniles. I hope that answered you. All right. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Sajina, you want to come in? Okay. Uh, hello, Nimesh. I'm Sajina. I have a doubt that uh, when we do molecular taxonomy as well as this morphological uh, based morphology based taxonomy, what we which we have give, which we give priority? Like you ex, uh, you explained that. Uh, uh, you synonymize the, the docencia singhala with the docencia filamentosa. Mm. So, and you mentioned that there is very less uh, genetic distance. Yeah. So, wh what about their uh, morphology was exactly similar or there were some difference in their uh, morphological traits like that? Yes. So, about the singhala, uh, we have seen some specimens, but I have not uh, studied the, comp uh, I have not studied, you know, I have seen some specimens, but I have not yet got the got the chance to have a look at uh, the you know big collection from the from the sri lanka so uh, based on more molecular uh, distances we synonymize the species and based on uh, the specimen uh, specimens that i have studied we saw there is no morphological differences as well uh, but you know uh, some characters they only, you can only found them in the in the live specimen so we have to be very careful with that so that's why whenever we go on field, we uh, first we collect the specific specimen and then we uh, take the photograph of that fish in the in, you know when it is alive. So you have to uh, take the photographs immediately so that you can uh, retrieve those uh, characters in your photographs. And those are that, that is very uh, very important. And about uh, your your asking about uh, was asking about molecular or morphology. Well, I will say you have to pay attention to the both molecular as well as morphology, because uh, uh, you know uh, it's an integrative approach that you have to choose. You can't just completely rely on the molecular study, and you can't just completely rely on the uh, and neither you can't completely rely on the morphological study. So you have to combine this both, and then you have to make uh, a sense out of sense out of it. Yeah. Okay, and thank you. Uh, for example, if we give very completely similar genetic makeup, and but we know that their coloration patterns or some bands are very different, so we can we treat them as a different species or like that? Like some fishes, we get they are very similar in the genetic makeup, huh? but we know when we observe them, not in the their mouth structure, everything anatomy may be similar, but the bands coloration. Right. That way, if it is different, can we treat them as a separate species? Like, can we think of making a new species based on only coloration? No, that no, no, because in, in such case, in such case, you have to observe the phenotypic variation in that species. So, for example, Daukensia filamentosa, 
Uh, I will do one thing. I will just open the one of picture of uh, one of image of Daukensia where I have. I can show you actually the. Okay. Uh, In one species, you showed four patterns of uh, that tail. That one. Uh, yes. No, I'm just getting where is my paper. So. Okay. So, uh, okay, so I'm going to share the screen over here. Okay. Okay. So actually here you can see okay. over here, uh, you know. So this, uh, the, pic, uh, the first uh, fish is actually a Daukensia uttara. So that we describe mm -hmm. uh, from the total western guts, okay. Mm -hmm. And down there, there is this Daukensia filamentosa, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, then there is this Daukensia filamentosa. So this Daukensia filamentosa is from the northern western cut. This is from the southern western cut. And this is from the, uh, from the, from the east flowing rivers. Okay, so you can actually see that there is a lot of morphological variation among uh, among these three uh, species. Okay, mm -hmm. so in this paper we have only given the three images, but I have seen almost more than more than hundred images of this uh, Daukensia filamentosa, and every time people they send me the this one. So there is a lot of phenotypic variation you will see morphological variation you will see in this uh, particular species, and it is quite obvious because. Uh, uh, because you know it is widely distributed species, so definitely you will see. Uh, you know it is uh, quite obvious that you will get uh, variations in uh, Variation. uh, variations okay. in this. But once you look at the genetic structure, um, no, they are not very different. Okay, again, here is the are the characters. Okay, if you count the scales, lateral line scales, they will be all uh, similar. If you count the barbell length, they yeah. will be all overlapping. So it makes no sense to just classify them uh, as a or the designate them these populations as a different species just based on coloration pattern. Okay, there has to be some solid morphological characters. Um, uh, you know, to, uh, to be uh, to be a new species. Yes. Oh, okay, thank you. Yes. Um, uh, there's one uh, someone Abdul Wahid asked, do you have any comments on the Denison barb? Uh, Denison uh, Denison barb. Okay. Uh, oh, comments. Uh, okay. Uh, Denisoni Park in in what sense? I mean, uh, yeah, maybe he can come in, come in and talk. Abdul? Can you just uh, give him the access to? Yeah, he can unmute. Yeah, Abdul. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just want to uh, have you done any uh, uh, research on that or uh, uh, anything you have collected. Uh, of, 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 of the uh, hello hello yes uh, okay so um yeah so um so there is uh, the uh, you know the most comprehensive work on the Denisoni barb is actually available so you can actually see that uh, so there is a paper published by uh, my my uh, supervisor and my colleagues as well you know, on the Denis report so where they have uh, where they have collected specimens across the Kerala from uh, from different ways uh, from different river systems of the Kerala and where they have shown that uh, you know currently the, the, there are only two valid species in this genus in Sayadriya uh, but they have shown that there is a great genetic uh, divergence between different populations different different river populations and those populations can be calibrated as a as a uh, you know uh, as a different uh, species so there is great genetic divergence uh, in this uh, in this uh, uh, in this group in sayadri sayadri yeah. one uh, last question from mukesh kumar singh uh, he is asking do you have any recent information about the distribution and availability of pundias and pethia from eastern india uh, sorry, Deepak, I didn't. Uh, can you please pardon? 
Yeah, is any, do you have any information about the distribution and availability of Pundias and Pethia from Eastern India? Pundias and Pethia from Eastern India? Yes. Um, uh, we, uh, uh, so Eastern India, that means uh, I'm considering Eastern India as, as from Bengal, right? Bengal or yeah, that, that's from only Africa, I see not, it. Not yeah. the northeast region because northeast region is totally uh, different. Yeah. Okay. So yes, we have collected. Uh, in fact, in 2014, we launched an exp. We uh, took an expedition to the to the Bengal where we collected all the species and almost all the species that were that 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 were described by the Hamilton in 1822. So to have a look at all the Hamilton's uh, species. We made an expedition over there and we come across to some Pethia over there. So there is Pethia Tikto as well, which is uh, which is not very, which was widely distributed, but it is now, uh, you know, it is now restricted to some pot, pockets there. Uh, the Conchonius is very widely distributed. So Conchonius is popularly known as uh, rosy barb in the, in the aquaria, in the uh, hobby. So, which is, uh, you know, a more widely distributed species over there. But there are other Pethias as well in, I guess, that, that are described from the Poonch Bihar. Uh, Pethia gelius uh, 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 is over there, Pethia gelia and the Pethia uh, canius over there. So, yes. Even in Pintius, you will find over there, Pintius, so for Pintius, Sarana, these species which are yeah. typical of Ganges river system. Yeah. So I think that, that was the last last question and uh, we are already gone uh, okay. uh, beyond our time limit. So, uh, so let's wind up our talk here. If any have any more questions, please contact, um, you know, Unmesh directly. Can you show okay. the last last slide of it, your email address to everyone once again? Yes, 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 yes. Or oh, you can type in, maybe that's probably easy to copy down. Yeah, just. Yeah, done. So that's u.katwate at bnhs.org. So yeah. if you have any, um, any more questions, you can ask Unmesh directly and uh, don't miss out the video. Do you have the link to the video? Did you? Yes, I have. Uh, I can upload it again if you want. Yep, yeah, here you go. Yeah. Uh, there is some other questions that are asked. Uh, no, I guess. No. Yeah, that should, that should be. So thanks. Thank you, Ramesh and Mesh. Uh, excellent talk. Okay. And I wish you good luck with your completion of your PhD. Okay. <laughs> and most of our audience are probably from Kufos as well. So they may be familiar to you. And I saw a few, yeah, some of the team members in your pictures were from Kufos alumni. So. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So good luck and I wish you all the best. And thanks everyone for joining in. And we will uh, uh, meet again in two weeks for another exciting talk. Thanks very much. Uh, see you in Mesh. See you, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, Deepak. And thank you, everyone, for attending this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, so thank you very much. Thanks, Deepak, for giving me the yeah. uh, no you know, chance to share. We will get you again. We will get you again for another talk when you finish your PhD. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, see you. Bye. Yeah, see you.